Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have, have uh, Rick Averett here uh, from UCSD. And uh, he is a you know, pioneer of uh, work in the fundamental physics and applied optics or electrodynamics of nanoscale and correlated electron materials and also metamaterials. Uh, so Rick uh, got his uh, PhD in 1998 in applied physics from Rice University where he worked with Naomi Halas on synthesis and optical characterization of gold nano shells. Um, so plasmonic kind of uh, property in the visible range of these nanomaterials. And then he joined Los Alamos National Lab as a director's postdoctoral fellow uh, from 1999 to 2001, uh, working there on time-resolved spectroscopy of correlated electron materials and metamaterials. Um, in 2001, he became a member of the technical staff at Los Alamos National Lab and uh, stayed there until 2006. In 2005, in fact, he also became a member of the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies, which is a very well-known nanoscience center in the U.S. that is housed at Los Alamos National Lab and Sandia National Lab. And then in 2007, he joined uh, Boston University as a faculty member. Um, in the physics department and the uh, Boston University Photonics Center. And at some point I visited you there, uh, which was somewhat a fateful visit because it happened on the day of the Boston Marathon bombings. And so I flew there, spent my day in the hotel, locked in, and then flew back again. <laughs> but but it was later, that we, we kind of, we came back again. And uh, we had a number of these travel run-ins. So we were just discussing yesterday that when we came back from a conference in China, some of the pilot announced that the cockpit window was rattling, making noises. And so we had to turn around and let the fuel off. But so far, nothing has happened on this trip except for fire yesterday at the Biodesign Institute. But <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, and since then, since 2014, uh, Rick joined the Department of Physics at UC San Diego, where he is in a very stable uh, local minimum state, high activation energy, and working on his on his research. And so his research uh, uses, as I mentioned already, studies fundamental physics. Um, in and so uh, he uses ultrafast optical lasers in the broad uh, speckle range from terahertz to the visible. Um, and in particular, to be able to uh, both measure and also control fundamental excitations in matter. And in particular, he is also known for his work on meta materials uh, that is a that he will explain to us, I guess, uh, in this talk. Now, Rick is um, a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's also a fellow of the Optical Society of America, and his work is uh, cited more than 32,000 times, uh, which gives you an idea of the impact of this work. So we are very uh, fortunate to have you here and look forward to your talk today. Well, thank you, Robert, for the very kind introduction. Known, uh, yeah. Robert for quite some time. Our careers have overlapped quite a bit, so I've learned, I've learned an immense amount from his work over the years. Uh, so it's fantastic to be here. So for for the students, uh, I can tell you that this is, you know, it's been fantastic to visit and see what's going on here, and 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 seeing, you know, basically the different compact X-ray sources that are existing and being built up is just fantastic. It's just it's just really exciting time here at ASU. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and. Uh, give a talk. And so what I'm going to tell you about is towards properties on demand in quantum materials. The first question I always get, and I'll just answer it now, is what is a quantum material? That's a, everyone will have their own answer, but, uh, you know, I, I would say let's, you know, uh, you know, you might, you might want to say quantum materials or something that, you know, follow the Landau paradigm in terms of, you know, symmetry breaking and order parameters and maybe with their topology in there. But I would say for the topic purposes of this talk, let's keep it very broad and just say quantum materials is everything. And, you know, uh, if you have some sort of ability to uh, do massive changes with fairly gentle perturbations, to me, that's very interesting. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about a little bit today um, in terms of the research we've been doing over the years. Um, Okay, so uh, 
So, you know, the, the way I look at it is we work on different things. Uh, we work on metamaterials and plasmonics. We work on correlated electron materials where we're trying to do things like photo-induced control or we're looking at non-equilibrium phenomena. And I distinguish these two saying that sometimes we care about the materials and sometimes we care about the phenomena. But light doesn't care about any of these. If you know, light, light is happy to in investigate all of these. And so we like to investigate these different things, you know, plasmonics, quantum materials, and metamaterials, and even try to merge them and try to do interesting things. Okay. Um, now, what I would say is if you know, if you if you're not going to listen to all this talk, the thing that I would say that we're most inter most really interested in in kind of this simplistic fashion is we're interested in um, complex energy landscapes, which might be another way to describe a lot of quantum materials where because of uh, competing uh, interactions and materials, say between the charge orbital and lattice degrees of freedom, you can have a very complex uh, energy landscape where with thermal probes, you might only uh, measure ground states, but then with optics and other sorts of techniques, you can really maybe find new metastable states that have very interesting properties. Another way to think about this in terms of doing things with light that we'll be talking about in a little bit is with dominoes. And the reason dominoes have been kind of discussed in terms of uh, these sorts of things, if I can get this video to run, do that. Well, it looks like I can't get the video to run. But anyway, the idea here, of course, is the following, that you have something like an ordered crystal. And if I played this video for you, you'd see the crystal growing, putting these each wall of these is 700 dominoes. They take 20, something like 60 hours to build this crystal. But then you come over here in a very gentle perturbation in your hand, which is the electromagnetic perturbation in that case, perturbs that crystal and you create either a disordered state or a new order, some sort of uh, new ordered state with some sort of maybe uh, defects and stuff. But you know, if you play this reverse, then you see, of course, the dominoes build back up. And that's what we'd really like to be able to do with light is to be able to do electromagnetic perturbations and control things. And of course, some of the things we'd like to do uh, in terms of adding energy to a system like every night when we cook brown rice at my house is to kind of end up with these you know, new states that are ordered in terms of you see this hexagonal kind of patterning that appears in, 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 um, in the, right, the brown rice when you cook it in the rice cooker. Another example that gets a little bit closer to electromagnetic perturbations is this is actually, for those of you who don't know, this is fulgurite. So when uh, a lightning bolt strikes the ground, you can get this nice crystallization process. It's a single shot sort of experiment where you see these interesting things pop up out of nowhere. Um, and then ultimately the things that we wanna do is this is an example that I'm not gonna be able to go into too much detail today. This is the example where we come in and set up with a lightning bolt, we come in with a short pulse laser and we do something where we turn a charge ordered anti-ferromagnetic insulator into a ferromagnetic metal, okay? And to me, that's just absolutely fascinating. And it's so metastable that we can then go do near field studies on it, right? So it's this idea of, of perturbing things and trying to uh, look at these complex systems. This gets to this idea of properties on demand in quantum materials. Um, you can see this review from 2017 that uh, wrote with Dimitri Bassoff and Dave Shea. But the idea is, of course, that there are many sorts of perturbation to try to control complex materials. You could talk about high pressure, magnetic fields, electrostatic gating. It just so happens that some of, some of us, Robert, myself, and uh, Sam, for example, in this room, we like to use electromagnetic perturbation to try to do this properties on demand. And one way to think about this is a lot of these materials uh, are very sensitive to perturbations. You can kind of tune them to the edge of being very sensitive. So just like those dominoes, you very lightly push something and you get this massive change. And when you think about the range of phenomena that you have the potential to try to control with light or with other techniques, it's really massive, right? There's interesting things of superconductivity, metal insulator transitions, you know, all these other ones that I've listed here, okay? And it all boils down to, um, again, trying to control and manipulate these interacting degrees of freedom um, you know, so you, a way you could think about this in terms of the optics is you're trying to manipulate, you know, charge orbital lattice and spin degrees of freedom. To, and, and another way to think about this is you're trying to kind of catalyze emergence using light in these complex materials by just tickling them or in some cases not tickling them so much. Okay. Um, okay. And so the way we do these experiments, just, I'll, I'll go into this in more detail later, not too much detail, but, uh, a lot, I would say a lot of the 
uh, experiments where you're doing dynamics controls of quantum materials with light. It's really just simply a pump probe spectroscopy where you come in with some pump, you perturb the system, and then you come in with a probe at some delayed time and you measure some characteristic of that probe light, be it scattering, intensity, transmission, reflection, polarization, to, to gain some insights into how, how that system evolves after you deposited that energy density on a very fast time scale. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, this is, I'm going to go over some examples, but not in any detail. This is very much for the next couple of minutes, just a bird's eye view of some of the things that people in this area are trying to do that e even without going into the details, hopefully you see that it's kind of exciting ideas. Okay. So um, going to this bird's eye view, uh, one example that's very exciting is this idea of what we would, what I would call photo aug augmented a superconductivity or coherent condensate response. Okay, so it's a really neat idea to think that you know you have this ability to come in and photo excite some sample and photo induce a superconducting response that wouldn't be there, or maybe you make that superconducting response emerge at a higher temperature. It's just an exciting idea. Just you know, you know, and, and I'd say it has more promise than some other techniques that have been investigated lately. And, and in any case, it's fun. And then another thing you could think about is uh, on superconductors, you you can do things, you know, like driving coherent order parameter modes. Okay, so you can think about superconductors having a Higgs mode, and there's really beautiful experiments starting back in 2014 of seeing this coherent response of the superconducting condensate, right? So this idea of manipulating superconductivity or looking at the coherent response of a condensate, that's, that's that, to me, that's just a really exciting um, idea. Another one, and this is uh, from work we've done, um, something I would uh, love to talk about, but I'm not gonna be able to talk about in too much detail today, is uh, photo-induced metastability. In some, of, in some of these materials, we can come in and photo excite. And if you look at the conductivity, we could really uh, photo induce this uh, metastable phase transition. I showed you that back a couple of slides ago, but you can really get very dramatic changes by, uh, by doing this, you know, and you can kind of see, you can even see this visually, right? This is just a simple little movie that shows, you know, when you photo excite at low enough temperature, you see those dots and then those dots are metastable, but then as you increase the temperature, it goes back to the original phase and it's very much reversible, okay? Um, this is also an example of what I would call multi-messenger uh, spec, you know, studies of these quantum materials um, using different sorts of techniques. Sam, Sam, who's a, a professor here, basically did a really nice, for example, terahertz single shot measurement a few years ago to kind of get more insight into this. Okay, so that's a second idea, just this idea of manipulating the phase with light and creating these metastable states that have unique uh, kind of uh, order parameters. Another example uh, would, would be this idea of, can you control, can you do topological switching? Okay, so this really nice uh, example from 2019 on tungsten ditelluride, where they basically did either terahertz pump or a visible pump and then probed with ultra-fast electron diffraction. And they could see that in poten potentially you could, you know, basically do some sort of shear mode and, and, and kind of change things from say, a Dir you know, from like Dirac to whale. And so there's this idea of being able to manipulate the top topology of materials uh, dynamically with light. So I think that's also a very rich idea. And then the last example that I want to give that I think is really beautiful is this idea of flow K engineering, where you come in with light and now you need to think of the system as not something that's been perturbed by the light, but you think of the system as being a combined light matter system where you really have the characteristics of, you know, it's, the way I like to think about it, it's kind of, it's kind of like Robbie physics with dispersion because you're doing this in solids, okay? And so you can really see things, you know, this, there's this really... Uh, important papers where, you know, doing ARPAs, you could see these replica bands. But I think a very exciting idea, for example, is if you can come in and dress this uh, complex or quantum material, you can, for example, do something, if you can get to what's high enough of what's called a flow K amplitude, you could basically do things like modify exchange interactions and and, you know, so a system could be anti-ferromagnetic, but once you dress it with light, you could actually, if you can do it with a high enough flow K amplitude, you could turn this thing into a ferromagnet. So there's just these really rich ideas of being able to um, manipulate these quantum materials with light. Okay, so that's a very broad bird's eye view. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that's really important in terms of what's happened in the past 10, 
you know, 10, 15, 20 years is these are com these are complex materials. You're not going to just do one sort of study and understand the, the this range of phenomena. But luckily, there's been just an explosion of different sorts of probes and actually also uh, pumps over the past decade where, you know, these pump probe techniques cover from the far infrared, include electrons. And of course, as we're learning about is what's being built here, also soft X-ray and hard X-ray um, possibilities to look at dynamics of structure, okay? And so uh, if you want a nice overview of this, there's this review article from 2021 in Review of Modern Physics, Non-Thermal Pathways to Ultrafast Control in Quantum Materials. And you can kind of really see this multi-messenger approach where people are using optical probes, scanning probes that are timers off, scattering probes like x-rays, on-chip transport uh, probes, and things like ARPAs, okay? So there's this very rich uh, array of possibilities that didn't exist 15 or 20 years ago to study these complex materials. Way too much to talk about in a talk like this. So now I'm going to start narrowing down. Okay, after this bird's eye view, I'm going to start narrowing down into my my own little world. I apologize for that, but hopefully you kind of get a little bit of a picture of what's going on. And so what I'm going to focus on for the most of the rest of this talk is the terahertz region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Let me just tell you a little bit about what terahertz is. Uh, so once in a while, I do teach the you know the introductory physics courses, and I've been showing this slide for a long time. I get really sad because Whenever you know have a new crop of students, I want to tell them, hey, this is what terahertz is, right? But then you go look at the electromagnetic spectrum and all these introductory introductory textbooks, and they always just skip right from microwave to uh, to you know infrared. So I tore the page in half, and you know the the, the terahertz range is right here. But to give you a little bit more detail on that, um, you know, the terahertz regime roughly covers, let's say, from 0.1 terahertz to 10 or 30 terahertz. You know, kind of where microwave electronics peter out and infrared and laser techniques start to be difficult. So it's it's kind of this range. And just to give you some idea, since we could have people who like different units here, one terahertz corresponds to a wavelength of 300 microns, which is 400 Kelvin, which is 33 inverse centimeters, which is about four MeV, this many Rydbergs. And another way to say it is um, the microwave background was the terahertz background when the universe was about 3 billion years old, okay? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a feel of what terahertz is. And then the question is, why why should I spend so much time using terahertz to investigate these um, quantum materials? And the reason is, you know, it's really, um, there's, a, there's terahertz is a rich probe and actually drive now of low energy phenomena in quantum materials, okay? So you really have uh, all these exciting degrees of freedom, phonons, free carrier response, spin dynamics, uh, polarons, all these things can exist in the terahertz range. And so, you know, you want to target your probe to the phenomena you're trying to understand. And, and you know, that list I, of things I showed you earlier, spanning from superconductivity to topology, a lot of that has phenomena that manifests at terahertz frequencies, okay? All right. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to give you a very short idea of how maybe you could think about terahertz, uh, terahertz spectroscopy. You could think about it in the simplest sense is, is you know, an optical pump, this is optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy. If you want, just think about it as a picosecond ohmmeter, a non-contact picosecond ohmmeter. If you don't like that, there's, you can go into a lot more detail. If there's not time to go into it today, ask Robert, uh, Professor Kindel, he knows it's even more about terahertz than I do. So you can always get more details. But the idea is we just take the output of the lasers and can use various techniques to generate these terahertz pulses. And then we can use these far infrared pulses to do spectroscopy, right? But what's really nice about this is since they're coherent with the femtosecond pulses that generate them, we can photo excite the sample and now do uh, optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy and look at the changes in the conductivity of a sample. And just to give you a really trivial example, but I think it's kind of neat to see, you know, there's our terahertz pulses, okay? This is just a simple example of photo excited gallium arsenide. Here's our terahertz pulse. Now note, one of the things that's really neat about the technique we do is we measure the electric field. We measure the amplitude and the phase. It's a time-gated technique that allows us to do that. Um, and then you know, we can basically measure the conductivity, but we could come in and actually, uh, the gallium arsenide is semi-insulating, so you have a conductivity of zero. It's not zero here because what I've done, oops, 
is I've come in and photo excited and put carriers across the conduction band. And so you see a massive change, right? And that's just because now you have carriers in the conduction band that give this dude response. Don't worry about the dude response yet. I'm gonna give you a tutorial on that in just a minute, okay? This is just to kind of show you what terrorists can do. But then you could imagine that if you put carriers in the conduction band, again, arsenide is a function of time. You could have them recombine or have, get trapped at states and you could measure the way that conductivity evolves as a function of time, okay? So that's what I mean by saying it's a picosecond um, ohm meter. And of course, we have more sophisticated versions of this that I'm not gonna really go in today. I'll show you results from using these sorts of techniques. But one of the ones we've been using a lot lately is this broadband terahertz plate, broadband plasma-based terahertz source where we can really cover. It's a little bit hard to see here. Sorry for that. You know, with two different detection crystals, we can cover from uh, zero to seven terahertz with one crystal, and then really kind of like eight to twenty terahertz with another crystal. So it's this broadband technique that we have working really well in a cryostat. And another thing you can do is. Um, this is something that uh, Sam, uh, Professor Teitelbaum is an expert at, is, is, is this idea of tilted pulse front where you can really generate uh, terahertz pulses with enough intensity that you can actually derive dynamics with these. Okay, you can drive dynamics with this. Now here's something that I, I you know, there's a lot of work going on here at, um, at ASU on developing sources. And, and, and as I've learned today, and I think as they're learning, this is super hard work. But every once in a while, you get really lucky and you find a really simple source, but maybe not. Okay, this is something I found. I thought this was kind of interesting. Okay, this is a discovery of a new far infrared source. And I made this discovery on a Swiss Airlines flight from Zurich to ha Hamburg. Um, this, this source, look at this, this was energized in Germany. Here's the part I think that if, if nobody else appreciates it, maybe Robert will. But if you look, this is a, a, a Lunavit energy stick. It comes with the battery. And look at this, it has four far infrared insert it has all kinds of magnets and stuff so you know if and you can get it for you can get it for only 169 uh francs okay so i don't know i thought this was kind of interesting that you know i didn't i didn't know you had handheld terahertz sources like this that you could buy from the back of a magazine on an airline okay so anyways usually our sources are a little bit more complicated than that but you know that's okay. Some, maybe someday we'll get to something of a handheld terahertz source. All right. So now what I want to do is just give you a, a little bit of a background or a, a reminder of some very simple classical uh, physics where what I'm telling you is all that complexity. Now I want to try to bring a little bit of uh, understanding to that complexity I showed you in these in these materials. And what I'm telling you is you can pretty much think of all of this stuff first order in terms of what I would call the Drude response. And then also what I would say is a Drude Lorentz model. Okay. You can get a massive amount of intuition from these classical models. And then you might say, okay, well, you're going to apply this classical model to quantum materials. Isn't that kind of um, at odds with each other? And I would say the answer is no, because one of the beautiful things with some of the experiments we're doing is the changes are massive. And, and these are just phenomenological signatures that are the starting point to then do more complex things where, for example, if you're changing things as a function of temperature fluence or some other parameter, the quantum nature emerges then. Okay, and I'll try to give you a feel for that as we go through this. But let me just remind you what the Druden model is. Of course, we know, uh, so Paul, Paul Druda, he kind of came up with this very cartoonish model that works amazingly well for reasons beyond the place I'm showing here. Uh, or the advent of quantum mechanics. But of course, the way we could think about this is if you just have you know, some uh, electron that gets accelerated in a field and there's some momentum scattering time, uh, you know, then you can basically solve this and you get the Drude conductivity, okay, where N is the carrier density, tau is that scatter, momentum scattering time, M is the effective mass. You can write this as a plasma frequency, um, omega P is equal to N E squared over M. Of course, if you go into more complicated analysis, be it Boltzmann analysis or some sort of Kubo formalism under the appropriate conditions that are much more rigorous, this sort of formula still emerges, okay? But let's just look at, the, we just wanna use this as kind of a spectroscopic observable, okay? So as I mentioned with the conductivity, this is a plot of the conductivity as a function of frequency, okay? We measure the electric field, we measure the amplitude and phase. That means we actually, if we do it right, we get the real and imaginary parts of the conductivity. So let me just remind you what this looks like. This is the conductivity normalized to the DZ value of 1.0, plotted as a function of the frequency normalized to the plasma frequency. The Drude response, the real part, sigma DC, then it rolls off. The imaginary part will rise up linearly 
and then cross at 0 0.5 uh, of the DC value. And where they cross, that is the scattering rate. Okay, so that's one of the things that, you know, if you could see this or measure this, that's one way to think about the Drew response. Another way, of course, to think about it is you can write this in terms of uh, equivalent content, but you can write this in terms of the dielectric function. And if you look at the real part of the dielectric function, you see that basically it crosses, goes from positive to negative and crosses zero at the plasma frequency. Okay. That's interesting for a lot of reasons as well. Another way you can look at this is if you plot uh, the loss function, which is minus the imaginary part of one over omega, you get a peak uh, that tells you really something about the dielectric screening. These are the, this is corresponds to the zeros in that dielectric response, but that tells you something about the nature of the screening in the material. Okay, and that peaks at the plasma frequency. And then of course you could plug this into the equation for the reflectivity, and the reflectivity of our Drude response kind of has this very high flat reflectivity. And then when you hit the plasma frequency, it drops off. That's just telling you you're above the plasma frequency. The electric field is oscillating too quickly to basically for, for the electrons to respond. Okay, so these are the signatures of a Drude response. So this is kind of something to keep in mind as we go through the rest of this talk. Um, of course, the other thing that can happen is now if I go back over here, if I can get there. Of course, if I add some sort of restoring force to this equation, then I'm going to get a Drude Lorentz term. Okay. And so, of course, a Drude Lorentz term just means, okay, well, somewhere you have a Lorentzian because of some sort of restoring force in the system. One possibility is because of uh, phonons, right, that could exist in the system. This is just a plot of the real imaginary parts of the dielectric response. There's the Lorentzian response in a simple way where you have some sort of basically oscillator strength. There's the resonant frequency, and then you have the scattering. And of course, this looks like the Drude response if you get rid of that omega zero. And so, for example, if you were to look at the reflectivity, this is the so-called Resterlund bands. This is indium arsenide and gallium arsenide, where you have at the at the pole of this uh, function, you have the transverse optical response. Then it goes flat, and then this part looks very much like the Drude response when you go above the longitudinal optical frequency. It dips down and rises back up, and you kind of have this. Uh, region, the width tells you something about how polar the system is, and you kind of have this high reflectivity. Okay. So that might be something that a, 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 Drew, a, a Lorentzian might look like. Okay. So basically, you have a Drude response and you have Lorentzians. Um, I, I think it's always nice to kind of go back if, if you're uh, an early student. You know, you might actually take for granted, uh, you know, a piece of glass, but I encourage you to go back and think about, okay, well, Here's the refractive index of glass somewhere out here. Well, that actually arises from these peaks, these Lorentzians associated with some sort of transition at much higher frequencies. And it's really neat to think about, really go back and ask yourself, you know, why, why is the speed of light in a piece of glass C over N? Can you really answer that for yourself? And it's related to basically interesting, you know, basically light can obtain some character of the solid. So it's in some sense, the simplest polaritonic material, but it's mostly still light-like. But it's one of these things that's worth pondering. But again, it's just a Lorentzian response. Okay, and then the one other thing I just want to keep, keep have you keep in mind that this will kind of show up a little bit in some of the examples I give is uh, the final thing is you could have coupled resonances, just like you know the the two the mass spring two coupled mass spring systems that are coupled by this spring of spring constant kappa. The beautiful thing about the dielectric response to first order, you can learn about this coupling in materials, okay? So for example, what you can do is you can take a dielectric function that consists of a Drude response and a Drude Lorentz response. Maybe you have a semiconductor that's doped, so you have a, you have a Drude response and you have some sort of optical phonon. Well, you can have interactions to what we call plasmon phonon coupling, and that shows up in something as simple as this. If you solve for the not for the poles, but the zeros of this combined system, you get these two uh, zeros that are new modes that correspond to the upper and what we call upper and lower polariton modes. But it's really just systems coupling. You can really think about it like this. Okay, this will pop up a little bit in what I say as examples as we as I move forward. Okay, so that what I'm telling you is you could take the most complex materials. Or you can do it more complicated if you want, but I like this simplistic approach. Take this first order simplistic approach, classical models of Lorentzians and Drudes, and understand an enormous amount about materials to first order 
Okay, and so what I want to do now is for the rest of this talk, to the extent that I have time, I want to give you some examples. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to go in orders of increasing complexity. Okay, so I'm going to start with metamaterials, go to semiconductor plasmonics, and then time permitting, I'll spend, hopefully spend, I'll go through these pretty quickly and hopefully spend a few, you know, maybe 20 minutes on this example of superconductors and exotonic insulators. Keep in mind, everything I'm going to be talking about is uh, terahertz at, at terahertz frequencies. And I have to say that this um, axis of increasing complexity, it's a little bit arbitrary. I first learned about uh, correlated materials before I learned about metamaterials. And so when I was first learning about metamaterials, I thought they were more complex than the correlated materials. So it kind of depends on what you know a little bit, right? But I think you could make the argument that these are relatively simplistic and then we get to more sophisticated phenomena as we move forward. And one of the nice things to do, of course, as you learn about these things, this is actually purely classical. You can combine these things to create new things. And I'll show maybe one example of that real quick as we move forward. Okay, so first, I'm going to talk about the really simple, quote unquote, simple stuff. And this is metamaterials. Okay, the way you can think about this is this is literally just an LC resonance. Okay, so one terahertz is 300 microns. This little gold split, we call this a gold split ring resonator. This is actually two split ring resonators back to back. You have, uh, in this example, you have two, you have an inductor, you have a capacitor. These things are about 36 microns in this particular example, so roughly lambda over five, lambda over 10 with respect to the wavelength. So it's a sub-wavelength thing. You usually pattern these into an array and you have an array of LC re re resonators, okay? So LC resonator, if you think about what you learned, that's gonna be a resonance. That's gonna be a Lorentzian resonance, okay? So then if you go measure this thing with the electric field pointing in this direction and you measure the transmission as a function of frequency, um, you can see various modes that show up. I just want to focus on this one here. This mode, this lowest frequency mode, omega zero, corresponds to the current that you see here. It's a circulating resonance. That is the LC resonance, okay? So it looks pretty simple. So there you go. There's a simple example of a Lorentzian resonance to describe this. And you have these higher order Lorentzians that are basically dipolar modes. Um, okay, but this is, so this is just a simple example. Okay, now what we can do, and this was done quite a while ago, uh, but it's 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 it kind of gets the point across in terms of large effects with small perturbation. So th this particular set of uh, split ring resonators was grown on gallium arsenide, okay. And so now there's basically gallium arsenide in this gap. If I do fairly gentle photo excitation, well, what's going to happen? That gap is going to get shunted by the carriers in the gallium arsenide, okay. And so you can see the resultant effect is massive, right? That LC resonance es essentially goes away. Okay, and so this is a very nice example of being able to manipulate and control a resonance, you know, not exactly a quantum material, but it's, you know, you could imagine now, of course, putting split ring resonators such as this on quantum materials. We've done that in some cases. I won't, I won't be able to go into that in too much detail today, uh, but it's a big effect. And, 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 you know, the thing that's really neat about these is you have this terahertz, 300 microns, gap, two microns. You localize and enhance that electromagnetic field by something on the order of more than two orders of magnitude. So it's just a kind of an interesting sort of material. But for the purposes of this, I'm just showing you as an example of a Lorentzian that can easily be manipulated just by optical excitation. Now, um, another one I want to show you just to go back to what I was saying a minute ago is coupled resonances, right? So this is an example of coupled reson resonances. We took a uh, two layers of split ring resonators and we just reversed them, okay? That's called a broadside uh, coupled split ring resonator, okay? Uh, this actually gets rid of something called bi-anisotropy because if you only have one layer, you actually drive a magnetic dipole in the system. So there's inherent complexity, even in something like this, that's more complex than you think. But the symmetry of this, you get two opposite circulating currents that cancel out the magnetic, magnetic dipoles. But what I wanted to show you here is we made a bunch of samples of this. And as you basically shift those layers with respect to each other, you're gonna change the interlayer capacitance and the mutual inductance. And you're gonna see a pretty, they're identical resonators, but you're gonna see a pretty massive change, right? And so this is just a, this is an example. You know, this is a very simple example of coupled resonators that you can tune uh, just by shifting these. Um, you know, and when you do the full wave electromagnetic simulations, um, they eventually, wow, I didn't know we did that many samples, but we did. Okay. 
the simulations match very well. Okay, you don't see two resonances because the resonances are re resonances are identical. Okay, but you can do stuff where, for example, if you made asymmetric resonances and you decouple them, then you actually see basically two modes split and merge. Okay, so you can kind of look at some kind of artificial strong coupling in terms of, but it's just really just coupled resonators, okay? So that's a simple example where just looking at Lorentzians and knowing about Lorentzians and, and thinking about the problem, you kind of learn a lot about it, okay? Okay, the next example I wanna show is um, uh, semiconductor plasmonics. This is something we've been thinking about for a while. For a long time, I worked in plasmonics at optical frequencies. You typically take these metals, you shape them, and you get these beautiful resonances that have these nice colors. You think about trying to do this at terahertz frequencies, you can, you have two options. You either make metamaterials like I showed you, but a thing that might be nice is how could you get a true plasmonic, re plasmonic resonance, which is a coherent oscillation of the electrons where there's a restoring force provided by the surface essentially. But one way to do that is to take high mobility uh, semiconductors and pattern them, right? So what we decided to do is get N-type indium arsenide doped and we made disks, okay? And so this is now, if you look at this and you think about it and, and you see it as a plasmonic particle, well, you again think Lorentzian resonance, you can do some calculations and you see that there should be some sort of field enhancement, which is relatively low compared to metamaterials. But when we made these, um, you know, this was a while ago, but we made these uh, into a hexagonal closed packed array of these disks and we went and measured them. Here's what's interesting about these. Okay, this is a terahertz transmission as a function of frequency, but here's what's interesting. Uh, first of all, we guessed things right in terms of the cal calculations and the doping. So we had this really nice plasmonic resonance right at 0.8 terahertz. But here's the thing that's, that, that I really like that, I, that I, we were a little surprised with is we now come in, that's at 30 kilovolts. And we now increase the field strength of that terahertz, okay? And so now this starts to be something that's a little bit uh, less trivial because if you look, that resonance at 300 kilovolts per centimeter is almost completely quenched. It's basically gone away. And so you have to think about what, what would that be, okay? And so I wanna tell you what that would be. Um, what that would be is the following. So, well, first of all, I'd say what we did is we did simulations and we changed the mobility. And if you change the mobility in the simulations, you can match this pretty well. But how would you change the mobility? Well, here's how you would change the mobility. So these terahertz fields can drive this intervality scattering uh, probably predominantly from the gamma valley to the M valley. And if you look, the effective mass is an order of magnitude larger. Okay, so it's a large order of magnitude larger. That means the mobility is going to drop down by a considerable amount. And so this is a nonlinear effect where you drive intervalley scattering from that high terahertz field to 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 really kind of non nonlinearly control the plasmon resonance. Okay, so this we have some other ideas of things that we're thinking about here. Um, but this this was kind of neat. But one of the things we always wanted to be able to do is we wanted to come in and tune that plasmon resonance by being able to inject carriers, right? We should be able to do photo excitation across the band and um, tune this resonance because the plasmon resonance is proportional to the carrier density, right? So it goes as the square root of the carrier density. Um, it didn't work with those disks. And for various reasons, uh, basically screening effects of the substrate, it wouldn't work. So we got a little bit more sophisticated. This is work that we did a while ago, and we're, but we're still writing it up. And so our collaborators at Boston University who I've worked with for a long time, Jin Zhang and her group, they, and these samples were grown by Seth Bank at UT Austin. Um, basically, we, we did this etching process where we, we had a a growth layer, we had a layer underneath that we could kind of etch away and so under etch. And so now you have these, what I call uh, plasmonic mushrooms that are standing something on the order of 500 nanometers off the surface. And that's enough to give a very much different effect than what I showed you on the previous slides, okay? So we're gonna do the same sort of thing, but instead of here, instead of coming in with a high field terahertz pulse, we're gonna photo excite across the band gap. We're gonna come in with uh, basically 0.5 EV pulses and we're gonna probe uh, the response of this, okay? And I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but I think the results are, uh, if they ever show up, they're, at, they're actually rather dramatic, okay? So this is the reflectivity as a function of frequency. And what you can see is we were able to measure this from you know on the order of one terahertz or so out to 14 or 15 terahertz. This, this region here is where we're switching over from uh, a gallium uh, 
phosphide to a gallium selenide detection crystal, so this part don't worry about. But what we have here is if you look at the equilibrium curve that orange, well, near equal, actually the equilibrium curve is, it's a little bit hard to see, but just take the orange one. That's the near equilibrium curve. It's pretty flat. And then you see a phonon here. That's the, that's the transverse optical phonon of indium arsenide. But then you can see with relatively low fluences, when we photo excite, you see this plasmon resonance shift really a massive amount, right? It shifts from, you know, first of all, there's not one there. Until, and if it is there, it's very weak. But then as we increase, increase that uh, photo excitation, the plasmon resonance shifts and it grows quite a bit in amplitude, okay? So it's a pretty dramatic effect. And again, that's an example of what I would say is uh, small perturbation, pretty large effect that was in some sense engineered. Um, now, one thing that's not gonna be evident here, but if you do a more careful analysis, but we're not, I'm not, I don't have time to show it, is there actually is this plasmon uh, phonon coupling. And so one of the reasons why this plasmon gets so much stronger as, as you photo excite is it, it's basically starting to become a mixed mode where it gets a little bit of phonon character and that allows this amplitude to grow. Okay, so that's another kind of couple mode phenomena that starts to arise in this system. And of course you can do things like, you know, for the highest, for that highest excitation, you can then measure the dynamics and see how this plasmonic response evolves as a function of, of time following photo excitation. Okay, so those are a couple of examples where we've played around with and we're continuing to play around with that, that are kind of in that range of, I guess what I would call uh, lower complexity, increasing complexity. But now I wanna really get into the stuff that's definitely, I don't think anybody would argue is quantum materials. I'm gonna give you, I was gonna give you three examples. I was gonna talk about superconductivity, metal insulator transitions and excitonic insulators. I think that's too ambitious. <laughs> So I'm, it's probably already too ambitious. Uh, so I'm probably, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about, give you an example of this photo-induced superconductivity. Again, I can't go into the full details, but I then wanna tell you a little bit more about our most recent work that's been submitted um, on excitonic insulators to give you a feel for that. That's something that I'm pretty excited about. It has several, several unique features to it, I would say. Okay, so I wanna tell you about a little bit about the high temperature super, super, superconducting uh, cuprates. So in this particular study, we're gonna look at, uh, we're gonna look at, we're not actually gonna, I'm gonna first show you lanthanum strontium copper oxide, but we're gonna be studying lanthanum barium copper oxide. I'll tell you why in just a second. But for this, uh, per, for the purposes of this talk, of course, we usually think of, we, we know the superconductivity exists in these copper oxide planes, okay? But then these planes are separated from each other. And so what eventually happens is to get coherent 3D superconductivity, you have to have these planes talk to each other. And you can actually probe that, okay? You can come in and do what's called uh, probe. This, this is called, you know, this is a C-axis. You can probe that C-axis response. And so you what you really have is a layer of coupled and intrinsic Joseph's adjunctions. Okay, and I'm gonna do a time resolve measurement and you'd say, why do you, why, why do you wanna study the C axis? Why don't you just look at the AB plane? The reason we don't look at the AB plane in a reflection type of study is in the normal state, it's metallic, it's highly reflecting. It goes into the superconducting state, it's superconducting, it's highly reflecting. Maybe the reflectivity changed by 1% and now you're gonna look at photo-induced changes of that 1%, which gives you a really low dynamic range. However, what I'm gonna show you is if we instead probe along the C-axis, we can look at that C-axis conductivity, we get massive changes and it's also a reporter of superconductivity. And you can actually understand this just from that Drude response I was telling you about, okay? So um, let me give you some of this. And this has been known for a long time. These are just, you know, I think this is one, one of the first, if not the first C-axis optical conductivity measurements by uh, Tamasaku back in 1992. But if you look at this, this is the reflect. This is lanthanum strontium copper oxide. Uh, I think it's where it's basically uh, near. Op it is optically doped. The electric field is along the c-axis. This is the reflectivity as a function of frequency. It's a little bit hard to see, but if you look at 40k, you're above TC. It's kind of flat. Not much going on. Then there's other things going on out here related to phonons. But then what do you see as you go to lower and lower temperatures? You know, when you get below TC, you see a plasma edge. Develop. That's just what I was showing you in terms of our little cartoons, or well, they weren't really cartoons, they were real, the Drude reflectivity, right? So you get a high reflectivity, and then you get this dip at the plasma edge, okay? And the, the lower the temperature you go to, the more pronounced that edge becomes, okay? So, and the reason I would, I'm telling you that's a reporter of superconductivity, because this plasma edge, 
uh, is basically proportional. You can treat it in terms of a fluid, uh, a, a two fluid res response in terms of uh, normal uh, electrons and then those that have joined the condensate. And the superfluid density is proportional to omega s squared. And so really what you're seeing is as you probe along the c-axis and you go into the superconducting state, that's reporting to you directly what the uh, condensate density is and is telling you about superconductivity. And, and of course, the effect is massive, right? You go from basically a reflectivity on the order of 50 or 60% to almost unity reflectivity. So it's a big signal, okay? And of course, you can look at it from these other characteristics that I told you about from a Drude response. You could plot the real part of epsilon one, and you can see above TC, there is no coherent conducting, you know, uh, there's no tunneling of Cooper pairs. And so you don't have a uh, epsilon one crossing zero. As soon as you hit the superconducting state, epsilon one crosses zero. And then as you go to lower and lower temperatures, the shifts. And of course, the other thing you see, if you look at the real part of the conductivity, uh, it basically drops off and becomes, goes close to close to zero, okay? So it's a nice reporter of superconductivity. So why do we care about that? Well, uh, this is based, This is kind of a follow-on to work that Andrea Cavallari's group has been doing for, for a long time in terms of looking at photo-induced superconductivity. But one of these materials that's really interesting is lanthanum barium copper oxide. And so this is the temperature, uh, this is the phase diagram, temperature versus hole doping. Um, and so, so as you come down in temperature, you kind of, in, in this 0.125, we're actually going to look at about 0.115. But if you look at just look at 0.125 for now, as you go to, you know, with increased doping, TC drops down, and so now you have this, you have the charge sequestered in the in the stripe kind of charge ordered phase, and so that's competing with superconductivity, and it suppresses superconductivity down to 4K, and then in, in the case that we're looking at, superconductivity is something on the order of. I forgot 10 or 12K, it'll probably be on one of the slides on the next on the next slide. But then the question is, okay, well, could we somehow perturb that charge order and 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 release it where it wants to join the condensate and so kind of do photo-induced melting of charge order in favor of trying to establish superconductivity at a high higher temperature than you would other see otherwise see for that doping. Okay, and so we have an intent to be able to do that. Uh, we get these very nice crystals, five millimeters by five millimeters by again de goo, and we can kind of come in and do photo excitation and reflectivity and measure this response. Again, I'm not going to spend a huge, and again, so what we're going to do is we're going to come in, pump along the c-axis and, and probe along the um, um, c-axis, okay? And so I'm going to show you the response that we measure dynamically with that. This is first just the static characterization, what we're supposed to see. These higher measurements up here were done with FTIR thanks to Chris Holmes at uh, uh, Brookhaven National Lab. And here's our terahertz measurements. So, you know, at 30K and then at 7K, what you see is for this 0.115 doping, you see that you do get a plasma edge, but it's actually quite low and we can't catch the rise up because it goes out of our spectrometer's range. But anyways, you see the plasma edge develop. And you know we we have things aligned well enough, and we know what we're doing to be able to extract the optical connectivity, the plasma frequency, and that inverse loss function. All those characteristics of a Drude response that I showed you, and and it's dis dissipationless, and it has this sort of response. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to this is at seven Kelvin, so we're below the equilibrium TC of fourteen K. We're going to come in and photo excite. We're going to do this relatively gently, and I'm not going to go into all the details of this, but just to show you that what actually happens when we do this is we see the plasma edge pushes out further to higher frequencies, okay? And it lasts for quite a long time, right? So this new, this new uh, plasma edge is shifted out quite a bit and has a corresponding loss function and then a peak in sigma one, and it persists for hundreds of picoseconds, okay? So it kind of, if you were to take the, you know, what I said is that Drude response along the C-axis is a reporter of superconductivity. If you were to take this literally, it would say somehow you've released those charge ordered carriers and they want to join the condensate and they're at least trying. Something that tells you that's not entirely happening is that in this non-equilibrium situation, the conductivity sigma one isn't dissipationless, okay? So that means it's not just a pure superconductor. In fact, what you can do in terms of the simplest effective media modeling is just treat this as a, is a uh, is basically a two two volume fraction system consisting of superconductor and uh, a, a nice Drude metal, and you can see without doing too much, we can we can more or less fit sigma one quite accurately. We don't get sigma two quite as well, uh, but we haven't tried to shift anything. 
And this is probably because of some phase shift. But what this tells you is that there are regions that are superconducting, but the rest of it isn't superconducting, but it, it certainly has a, a very, a very uh, interesting Drug response with actually a very long scattering time. Okay, and it, so it's telling you, it looks like we've basically broken up that charge order. And then you have these carriers that maybe some of them join superconducting domains, but certainly this thing, it's like an incipient superconductor, like kind of wants to become conducting, but it doesn't quite happen because we don't have a hundred percent volume fraction of superconductivity. A next experiment on this would of course be to see if we could ever get to the point with someone like Dimitri Basov at Columbia of trying to do near field measurements of, of sort of state like this to look at it in more detail. Okay. And of course, so there's this really neat idea that, you know, um, you can look at some of the theory by Andrew Millis and his, his uh, postdoc really kind of looking at this idea of modification of intertwined order parameters where, you know, you can really under right excitation conditions, you know, basically go from a mixed order parameter to a coherent single phase order parameter. So it's a very rich idea that's worth thinking about more. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one, but what, I just want to say something else. This is something that we're, we've been trying to do. Coupling of metamaterials to quantum materials. I'm going to say a, three things about this. One, it's super cool. Two, every time I see a paper about strong coupling, they immediately jump to some sort of fancy, fancy quantum ha Hamiltonian. Three, I disagree with that. The first thing you need to do is go look at the simple classical electromagnetic modeling and see how much of that explains the phenomena you observe, okay? And so we've done that. And so there's this really, actually, this is actually a really cool paper. So the idea is, um, okay, I'm saying more than three things. I'm going to say like 10 things. So, so basically these patch antennas, if you put a superconductor inside of a patch antenna, you can really get this polarotonic coupling and split things. But the more exciting idea there is, is maybe you could suppress fluctuations and somehow modify or augment superconductivity. It's really hard to put things, superconductors in a patch antenna. So what we did is we know something about metamaterials and we know something about the C axis superconductors that I just showed you. So we could make these freestanding films of split ring resonators and slap them on top of that C axis superconductor, okay? And we actually see, um, I'll skip this one. This, this is just showing you that it's a couple mode, right? I took a Lorentzian resonator and I put it on top of a Drude response. So it's one of those coupled modes, right? Just like I was talking about. And we, and we do see splitting. Uh, and so this is an example of that. There's the tape sitting on top of the superconductor. This is a color plot, temperature versus frequency, bare crystal. So this is the reflectivity. This is just, this is just a plot of that uh, C-axis coherent response of the bare crystal. When we put the metamaterial tape on there, we see a massive renormalization of that Josephson plasma resonance. So we definitely get this polariton like coupling due to dynamic screening of the interaction of that metamaterial with, with, with the superconductor. However, uh, we can explain all of it with classical ENM. There's nothing there at this point that shows that we've somehow modified the intrinsic properties of the superconductor. And so, but I think that's really interesting. But I think now that we have a handle on doing these sorts of experiments, there's rich possibilities to, to pursue in more detail. Okay. I have about, how, how much longer can I go, Robert? Okay, so I'm just gonna have to miss this last part. Sorry, this is actually my favorite stuff right now, but I'll, I'll try to keep it really short. I'll, I'll try to just give you the punchline, okay? So uh, me, probably other people, a lot of people, we have always, almost always, not uniformly, um, talked about, uh, you know, when you do pump, optical pump terahertz probe, measuring the connectivity as it evolves as a function of time, like each snapshot in time is um, a static conductivity, okay? Um, I think that's wrong in a lot of cases. I think some of, this, some of these ideas need to be revisited. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you have really fast dynamics, then when you come in and probe it, you actually aren't looking at a linear time invariant system. You're looking at a linear time variant system. Okay, and so that means you can have really interesting phenomena that's not just static. Okay, and so what do I mean by that? Well, um, and I, I'm sorry that I don't have time to go into this. You can see new phenomena, new nonlinear optical phenomena. Okay, and so what we did is we started studying this tantalum nickel selenide. This is a this is a potential uh, quasi one D excitonic insulator, and when we photo excite it, we see this uniform increase in reflectivity and 
um, that arises from parametric coupling of driving the, we, we think this arises, I'm going to the punchline survey. We think that arises from basically uh, electron phonon coupling where basically the phonons serve as a reporter of the excitonic condensate, okay? But this is a nonlinear effect. This is not a slowly evolving conductivity. Oh, and by the way, uh, uh, we've been working on this with Eugene, with Eugene Demler. This is our data. This is the experimental fit. But it just basically says a really neat idea to investigate is driven systems where you have some sort of coherent order parameter oscillating at some frequency, and that can serve as basically something to drive par parametric effects inside of quantum materials. And it's a really interesting way to probe quantum materials. Okay. And unfortunately, I'm running out of time, but when we did this in this exotonic insulator, this putative exotonic insulator tannel and nickel selenide, we saw really neat phenomena. The most important of which, if you think that you're seeing something related to a quantum effect, is when we measure the, the, uh, the amplitude of this reflectivity response, which I would call stimulated parametric emission, uh, it rolls off with an order parameter like behavior, okay? And so that's a signature of seeing an order parameter that we think is related to the exciton condensate. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you very much about what an excitonic condensate is. Somebody please ask. Um, and, and it couples to those phonons and you kind of get some glimpse of this hidden order parameter that's really hard to detect otherwise, okay? And so again, we've done modeling with, and we've actually done uh, density functional calculations with Angel Rubio's group. And so I think it's a really neat, rich idea, one, because of the exotonic insulator, two, because of this idea of going beyond linear time invariant analysis, okay? And so it ultimately derives from um, kind of a squeezed phonon effect of the condensate. All right, with that, uh, a lot of people contributed to this work. Uh, Rubiot contributed to a lot of this work. He just recently moved to Stanford. Um, oops, I didn't want to do that. Sorry. Oh, very unhappy with me. Sorry, give me one second. Where did it go? Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, you know, a lot of people contributed to this, um, you know, and, and a lot of other people from Columbia, UC San Diego, um, and so it's it's really been a fun. You know, this is only a partial list of collaborators. And, you know, most of this work has been done through collaborations with with these really fantastic people and, and the students in my group. Um, yeah, Kelson was the one doing the superconductivity stuff. He's about to move to Hamburg. Actually, he's probably he's going to fly to Hamburg and start a postdoc there in about a week. Okay. Uh, so anyway, thank you for listening, and I hope I hope I've kind of showed you this idea that non-equilibrium dynamics and quantum materials is really a rich idea. And and you know I you know thank you for your time.